my name is Rachel Sunnishell. I'm a Program and Development Coordinator here at the Library. And I'm very happy to have Yun and Yi here this evening um, to talk about her adventure and Steve's um, homeschooling on a 48-foot catamaran that they built in Hawaii. Had two sons and, and sailed around the globe homeschooling their two sons. And Yun and Yi was born in South Korea. Uh, from there, she went to Germany, met Steve, who's tonight's videographer, um, and uh, got married in Vienna, went to Hawaii to build the catamaran, and off they went on their amazing adventure around the world. And so I'm really excited to hear the rest of the story. Um, and there are snacks for after the program, there are books for sale, and I'm going to bring up some water in a moment. Oh, okay. Um, so please help me wel welcome Yen and Yi. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, uh, Rachel, for uh, organizing. And uh, I'm kind of glad it didn't snow because it's not <laughs> yeah. yes. I was worried about the uh, weather. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I uh, postponed it to March, thinking that February would be you know, too snowy. And uh, so I, uh, I'm talking about my book. and. It's called the Ring of Fire, and uh, I first I started to uh, writing this book is for my grandchildren because uh, uh, I have two children, two sons, and uh, they are half Korean and half the other <laughs> white, and and then when I see my grandchildren, they are already one fourth Korean and then three-fourths uh, the other. So I thought maybe you know, they will really disappear into something that they wouldn't really uh, remember. So that's the way I started start writing. And, and then it's, I kept going. So, so that's uh, why the book, book it became first the 70 page. is mostly about uh, my uh, it, life in Korea, and after that, it goes to, uh, like Rachel said, I was in, I uh, went to Europe, and then I met Steve in, uh, in the language school in southern Germany, and then we uh, went off to Hawaii and built a boat. So, uh, first part, I talk a lot about, great deal about my uh, grandmother, and my grandmother and my mother, that's the, uh, they raised me in the, after the uh, Korean War. And so we are pretty much grew up in a, I lived in a very uh, power, uh, po poverty stricken, you know, like a little ghetto like area. And, but my uh, grandmother has a, a great character. Uh, she was born in 1888 the year of a tiger. That's the way I figured out her age, because my son was a Arno, the one that's living in uh, Barry, was born in the year of a tiger, so I had to subtract by uh, 12 years of 12 at a time, and then so it came out 1888. That fit my grandmother's age. And she was a, a daughter of a, a Chinese, a healer of Chinese medicine at that time, and and yet she wasn't sent to school because she was a girl, and her her half brothers were sent to school, and later on they became principals and the teachers, and so she was a uh, uh, during the occupation, so it started during the occupation in the nineteen, I so nineteen thirteen, so she was a uh, uh, young. And she was, uh, I think she was married some of the, those times, and she was to, married to a very poor man who liked the gambling. So she, and when she died, uh, he, she was left with a lot of debt. And so she couldn't re uh, manage her family and uh, children, so she went to Japan. And eventually she re reunited with children. And so she's a very hardworking woman and uh, quite a character. And so I wrote a lot about her. 
and my uh, my mother and one of her siblings were born in Japan during the war, and so she also uh, talked about the fact that she, when she was 13, she went to school uh, in the mornings, and in the afternoons she was in a factory, uh, ammunition factory. And so there was, a, so I was trying to figure out if that was because she was a, a Korean children, and, uh, uh, or maybe all the children at that age were, you know, spending their times in the afternoons in the uh, factories. So that I don't really know, but my mother was there. My grandmother was there. So I'm going to read the, the part that my grandmother was a, uh, really quite the uh, character, and so I think I, I think I need uh, I need glasses. You know, I'm at an age where uh, I cannot see too well with the glasses, and I cannot see. To wear without glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so harmony means it's a cor in Korean as grandmother. So that's the way I refer in my book. Harmony was annoyed when someone stood around with their hands in their pockets as if there weren't anything to do. When my cousins did this, she sewed their po pants pockets shut. <laughs> Once my cousin put on uh, one of his new pair of pants with the pockets sewn shut, he was flabbergasted. He held his hands in the air. Oh, I laughed with exaggerated gusto at his dismay, and Harmony gave him a usual stony look. I see a strange parallel between my Harmony and Zorba the Greek. He says, I have hands and they do the job. That is what my harmony would have said so. I'm convinced that harmony and Zorba have met. If not, they should. These two people knew how to make things work. So when I think about uh, all the things my uh, grandma did all the, all the years, I lived with her until I was uh, 16, and my mother was working uh, wherever she could find work. And uh, so that was just, uh, okay, we didn't have anything. The only thing we had was a very clean room. I talk about that. It's like, a, it's extra clean because we didn't have any furniture, so we didn't have anything. We just had a little thing about to put our clothes to, uh, and then I, I even thought about that. She was a, I remember her in her the, uh, typical Korean traditional dress. It's called a hanbok with a very bulk, uh, bulk, uh, cumbersome big dresses. And usually it's all white. And then they are uh, quite clean. I don't ever see remember seeing her being like a grimy and uh, always clean. And then I, I had to help her holding the, the end. We ironed holding the end like a, uh, not like uh, the iron boards here, <coughs> and uh, so I, uh, I uh, now I'm getting older myself, and I have two grandchildren, and so I think when I was born, she was in her sixties. Because my my yeah my grand my grandmother was forties and yeah, in her sixties, so she kind of uh, really raised me and two of my cousins. So that, uh, my, uh, and then my mother was born in Japan during the uh, war. During, yeah, during, during the war, during the occupation. And uh, so she was the uh, fourth one out of four, uh, the youngest one out of four. And she uh, was uh, very optimistic <coughs> and uh, very happy person to be, and you can really tell the difference because there was, she was protected by uh, siblings, younger, older siblings. And, uh, but, uh, you know, they couldn't get away from their being Koreans. 
and uh, they, they lived in their own little uh, ghetto-like setting, but uh, basically uh, she was a quite uh, happy kind of uh, person. So like I mentioned that she worked in ammunition factory when she was 13 years old. And uh, after that, I think when she was 14, Okay, right, 1945. When she was 14, and then they went to they went they came back to Korea. So she worked the uh, the, uh, the teenagers uh, lived in a very kind of uh, hard time. And so I, this is a, a little uh, piece of uh, writing I did uh, on my mom. In in spite of the circumstantial. In spite of the circumstantial hardship, Oma kept her innate sense of beauty throughout her life. She was quick to pick up dance steps, and she was a popular dance partner at a party. She loved to dress fashionably and sewed and knitted without patterns. She often said after visiting a store, mine would be better than that store in the store, and hers was better. She improved the style by adding her own knitted or crocheted borders. Art folded into her life seamlessly, as if war never happened in her lifetime. And so after, so I was born in 1948. Three years after the, uh, World War II, 1945. And then uh, Korean War happened in 1950. So I was two years old. So my grandmother and my mother, my grandmother and my mom and uh, my, carrying me and three of us uh, uh, moved around. And you know, I think they spent some time on a ship because they're evacuating the town and they're moving from one town to another. Uh, looking for a place to live and uh, stay alive. I lived uh, until uh, 16. With my, until 16, my grandmother was with me, and then I, from 17 to 19, 18, I lived with my mom, and then my grandmother moved in with us later, later on, and uh, I went to. Uh, Pre-med in Busan when I was 19, and then during the school break I went to Europe, uh, Thailand, and then from Thailand they were talking about uh, you know the possibility for me to go to Germany, and I didn't really know at that time, but apparently uh, South Korea and uh, uh, West Germany had a very uh, sympathetic relationship because of both of the countries who have divided the nations uh, just from the onset of the Cold War, 1947. So uh, a lot of uh, Koreans were exported to uh, West Germany as laborers, uh, nurses, and uh, so they uh, really welcomed uh, South Koreans. And then, of course, uh, North Koreans were on the other side in uh, East Germany. And uh, so I, I didn't know too much of that. And then my parents had a lot of uh, German friends. So they started talking about you know, my possibility of going to uh, Germany. So uh, I did. I went to uh, Munich. And uh, I had to you know, register as a student, and then I went to one of uh, language schools, which is I uh, had requ uh, required the language requirement in order for me to continue my school. And that's uh, I met uh, Steve in southern Germany, one of the uh, language schools. <coughs> and from there, and then we we got married. And we went to uh, Hawaii, and we built the 48 foot. Uh, catamaran, and in, uh, it took us, uh, I think, three years, and uh, three years to launch the uh, catamaran we called the Malachi. 
uh, Song of the Sea in Hawaiian. And, uh, and then it took us another three, four years to uh, equip with a mast and uh, uh, all the hardwares and all the things that we need. And also we had to get uh, used to how to sail the boat and not only just the learning to sail itself, but we also have to learn how to handle Malika itself. It's almost like uh, raising a kid. <laughs> <clears throat> because this was a, a spe a specifically a boat that's built, uh, just we, we built that boat and the designer, so there are only two of these boats. This, so they, uh, we don't know how this boat's gonna, uh, this boat will react, how we're gonna handle in a uh, different kind of weather, and what kind of, you know, if there are some kind of uh, stop out of boats, then they have histories how to uh, handle the boat. So there was a lot of uh, uh, fun thing. In Hawaii, we were uh, sailing from island to island, and, uh, and <coughs> finding out, and because all, all the channels can be very rough between, uh, between the islands. And so we uh, used that, a lot of testing uh, hold out. And also there was a good place for us to learn how to navigate. Uh, we didn't know how to, well you can see uh, where we are and uh, read the chart, but then we actually had to learn to navigate, a celestial navigation. And so we learned to do that and uh, with, uh, going between the islands. And of course you can see the uh, land, and uh, but then uh, when I start doing that, and then I, I was uh, going by the book, and then I learned saying, "Oh, they call line of position," and I drew one line of position, and what it says is that this line of position, you know, I might, I will be on this line. So, so I got so excited, I, I actually made a line. So I said, "Oh, look at that, you know, like a, uh, I drew this line, and it goes right through here, but then." You, Actually, when you go out there, you don't really know. But then you, so that was the beginning. Uh, we learned uh, how to sail, <coughs> and we uh, made a two different two different trips. Uh, first trip was 1979 November. We took uh, we left Hawaii, and then uh, we were supposed to be we were testing our boat first first run from Hawaii to Bora Bora. It took us 21 days, and that was uh, uh, quite exciting because uh, we really don't, I didn't know how uh, what it was like to uh, sail for 21 21 days. I think about 2,000 miles, and uh, uh, I, we were very diligent, taking uh, sun shots every day and. The drawing the lines and you know making the positions every day. And then uh, I think uh, on 20 days. So it was the night before, we were expecting to see Bora Bora the next morning. And that night, I was in my uh, midnight watch. And uh, I, was, I usually went from midnight to either two or uh, from two to four or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> I think we did four hours, I'm, I don't remember, or uh, at night maybe we did two hours. And uh, uh, the, it, the weather was good and both was sort of reminding, you know, uh, taking care of herself and I was uh, sitting down and kind of playing with uh, this little uh, transistor radio and all of a sudden I was getting this, uh, uh, radio reception from Hawaii, and I was going, oh my God, <laughs> I think, uh, oh, I, I, we cannot be here, I, we cannot be, we, it, this cannot be. So uh, I mean, we're like 2,000 miles away, so I, I, I was uh, awake, and then I was going, oh my God, I went down and looked at the chart, and I come back up, and it was dark, and you cannot see anything else. And I don't know everything, and I don't know all the stars. So I, I was just so worried going up and down. And, and then uh, I couldn't really 
tell Steve that uh, uh, this is what happened. So, cause, and then I was going, and so it was his, uh, his watch is coming up. And I, I didn't say anything. I just went to bed and I couldn't go to sleep. I couldn't tell him. And then I think I sort of fell asleep. And then all of a sudden he says, like, Yeah, and I look, there's a forever right ahead of us. And, and I looked at it, I was like, Oh my God. And then and I think I said, I fell asleep. And, uh, and then I later on I told the people and then uh, other sailors. They said that happens all the time. Uh, that's the cloud formation. And so. You know, so that was a kind of, uh, I thought that was really spooky. <laughs> and we, uh, so I have uh, this one uh, section uh, in a third room. So I think that might be kind of fun to hear this uh, uh, for this uh, time of the year. One day in the third rooms, Steve decided to go for a swim. He stripped and stood on the top of the cabin as, he, as the boys yelled, How about the sharks, Dad? He brushed their question off in a dismissive way with his hand gesture and poised to dive into the oily-looking smooth water. And the boys shouted, Look, shark! We ran to the station and saw the shark spin silently slicing through the oily water. As it circled the Malachi, the boys threw in some perishable items. And without hesitation, the shark attacked them. After that incident, we didn't talk about swimming in the ocean again. <laughs> Instead, we walked around on the, de on, on the hot deck with a wet t-shirt and headgear, hiding behind the sunglasses to escape from the heat and glare of the sun. We wallowed in the hot sun that stole all the air from us. And, and when we saw dark clouds on distant horizon, we got excited. The rain and wind gave us a relief from the heat and water to wash the salty deck. If the rain lasted long enough, we caught fresh rain water in plastic water bottles. We, ran, we read the rhyme of the ancient mariner to dramatize where we were. We read this, this uh, every time, four times, we crossed the equator. Day after day, we stuck. No breath, no motion. As idle as a, a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. And then we saw a cloud in the distant horizon, and the glassy pane of water changed into ripples. Cumulus clouds moved into the hazy horizon, bringing in blue sky. It was as if someone blew a whistle, signaling a train to shift gears. With the so sound and sight of a hoisting sails, we moved out of the equatorial dark rooms and entered into the southern trade wind. The, so the sight of Orion was long gone, but now we had a southern cross. So it was a, a, a lot of a, a exciting going through the dark rooms. Uh, so a lot of times uh, people say, oh, it must be very peaceful and uh, very, uh, you know, uh, nice. It's really hot, number one. Number two, it's, it's, I find that being in the ocean is never really uh, quiet. It, it's usually something rattles or slaps or in the side of the water, a side of the hall, or something falls off, or <laughs> something always happens. And then uh, it's, the movement is so erratic, especially in a place like uh, uh, Darge Room. And uh, so we uh, sailed, like I mentioned, like uh, uh, we crossed the equator uh, four, four times. That means we went, uh, went to the south, 
and then we came back. We did all the uh, Polynesian island uh, in uh, Pacific area, and then from Samoa we went back to Hawaii, and so we crossed the equator. And then second trip, which was our last trip, uh, was 1984 February, and we left Hawaii. And uh, we, uh, at the time, we went all the way to New Zealand, Australia, and then went to uh, uh, Mediterranean, and through, and then we went up to uh, Thailand, uh, Bali, and so we saw that. So that uh, we made two uh, two different trips. That uh, when I mentioned the four times crossing the equator, and there was a. Uh, we were really used to uh, sailing in uh, trade wind area. So when by the time when we uh, start going to the Indian Ocean, their wind pattern is different. And also especially when we went through the uh, Red Sea. And I think we spent a little too much time in Thailand because we had an engine problem. And uh, it was really nice hanging out in Thailand, but uh, we spent much time waiting for the engine part that was coming from, I don't know where it was coming from. It's a Yanmar Japanese engine, so I, uh, if, I don't know if it came from Japan or it was coming from Thai, uh, Bangkok, but so it took a really long time to get the engine part. We finally got the engine part and we put it together and uh, we went, drove up, we drove out, and it blew, out, <laughs> blew up, so we came back. And I don't think we even went out 20 miles, I, I don't remember. So, uh, and then we sat there another for a uh, longer time that we need to. So by then, so when we left Thailand, uh, went to uh, Sri Lanka and uh, uh, Oman, the tip of the uh, South uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And then went to Yemen, and from there, Yemen, we went up to the uh, Red Sea, and then by then, already, we are kind of against the uh, prevailing wind, uh, because the, this uh, Red Sea, the weather pattern, is determined by the two, two big uh, weather system. One is in the south, the Indian Ocean. The other one is on the North Mediterranean Sea. So we are running, we are uh, sailing against the uh, element. Uh, by then, it was a little too late. So <clears throat> it was a uh, extremely beautiful that uh, Red Sea, and uh, but you can also see these uh, uh, flames from the uh, uh, oil drilling rigs. Uh, you can see quite a few of them from a distance, but you can see them really clearly. And then one side, and then the other side, is we will be sailing really close to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, so it's uh, like a beautiful desert. It, it's just an extremely beautiful de desert. And we're so between uh, Saudi Ara Arabia and the African continent. It's just, uh, and then the and when we're sailing against the elements, it just becomes like uh, uh, the uh, the waves. Like when uh, when you go into the, like uh, big oceans, Pacific, and uh, it's uh, they are coming from long ways and very powerful. But these uh, in, in the Red Sea, they don't have a very much area, so they. <coughs> So, uh, ocean uh, water is really choppy, and just like uh, we whole time it's like <laughs> <laughs> hobby horsing all the way, and then there was like uh, we are catching incredible number of fish when we go sailing uh, in a big uh, ocean like uh, you know in, especially in the Pacific we go in the stretch of the area or just like a, uh, it will be tuna fish we catch catch uh, tuna fish almost. Uh, as much as we want. 
So sometimes Steve throws the, we tell them, we don't want fish today. We don't want fish today. And then he said one day, he was saying, you know, I can see fish right there. There's all these birds flying in. We can, we can, I can catch fish right now. I said, OK, just a small tuna fish. And here he comes, the big tuna fish. <laughs> then, <laughs> so it's a, uh, and then, you know, and then we go to area, and then we just get like the, for days, we'll get like a mahi mahi. And, uh, uh, but in Red Sea, it's amazingly, you get different kind of fish almost every day. And just like really beautiful. So I think they still have that uh, really shallow uh, reefs. And uh, so it's a very interesting place. And then it's also Red Sea, the water is very salty because it's a really uh, concentrated and there's very small ex uh, water kind of access to like small in north and south. And so uh, the, our deck, because the water is so choppy and we are going, going against the wind, so like boats kind of hopping up and down. And then, so we get a lot of spray on deck. And uh, it was like, uh, the, our deck was almost becoming like a beach. And because this is the, uh, it was really salty, it was accumulated really a lot of salt. And uh, so that was uh, our uh, adventure, some sailing in uh, uh, Red Sea. Uh, I'd uh, like to, uh, you know, open the floor, so questions if uh, you'd like to uh, talk about. And then also, I, uh, you know, if people are interested that uh, my, uh, <coughs> boys were, my boys were homeschooled, and uh, uh, let me see, Stebaki, the older one, I think went to school maybe three years. Uh, and then uh, by the time when he went to uh, Mediterranean Sea in 1986, he was 16. And we already uh, arranged that he would be accepted into uh, Ryland's uh, Lyceum in outside of uh, Leiden, so, so it would be outside of Den Haag, and in, in Netherlands. So he, so when you when you reach the uh, Mediterranean, that was uh, May. Yeah, it was May. The end of almost the end of May, and then August, we took a train from France to. Uh, Netherlands to take uh, our kids to school. So he finished the uh, uh, Leiden uh, high school for two, uh, they call it a uh, baccalaureate program. And, uh, and, and then he's, he went to school one year in Hawaii. So it was three years all together in school. And he, was, he went to Amherst College after that. And, and then my younger one was, uh, yeah, he, he was in uh, Netherlands for two years in school, and then he went to uh, Caribbean uh, to spend time with Steve, and two years, and then he went to New England, and he's uh, teaching at Dartmouth. And so I think, uh, you know, uh, we can do a lot of things uh, when uh, kids are homeschooled or uh, living on a boat and all that is a, uh, it's a home. So I'm, I'm writing about, about home on strange shores. <laughs> so that's uh, uh, my other project. So uh, <coughs> here's Steve's here. He's uh, the one who built the boat. And uh, I guess a lot of people know him with his uh, boat. Uh, the one that he had in uh, Champlain, Lake Champlain, but he, he built uh, this uh, big uh, catamaran Malachi in Hawaii. And so if you have any questions, uh, I'd like to leave the room. Yes. Just curious, were the children born on the boat? Well, they were born in Hawaii, but you know. Wow. So they, they, they were born? You didn't deliver them on the boat. They were born on 
They yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, uh, they were born in ho uh, hospital. <laughs> That's I, just, I was just trying to imagine being on, as you said, hobby horse seats, <laughs> delivering this child and wondering, well, wow, that's just another thing that you were doing. So I was curious how that, how that worked. But they were, in, they were born in Hawaii? Yeah. You just had well, to find it. Like, like my uh, Arno, that's living in uh, water area right now. Very, very right now. But she was, he was actually very good, and he 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 wouldn't get uh, seasick. So uh, whenever water gets really rough, and I need to get some can of beans or something, and I would always send them out, send them to uh, get the you know go go to that uh, you know under the bunk, and I need uh, this and that, and then you know he. He, he doesn't mind, he's kind of like, are you all right? Because yeah, so he uh, takes the things out. And then, of course, he finds out all of those, my secret stash of cookies. And <laughs> <laughs> so yes. When you were in Hawaii, was Malachi your home? You lived on the boat while you were in Hawaii? Pardon me? Did you live on the boat while you were in Hawaii? Yes, we lived on, uh, let me see, we, well, before Malachi, we had another small little kind of whale boat, and then kind of uh, uh, turn it into a place, a little place we can live. And uh, uh, there's only, I think, uh, two years I lived on, no, no, maybe, maybe three years uh, on land uh, in an apartment. And the rest of the time, so I, we were always on the boat. So I was in Hawaii from 1970 to 1984. Um, did you uh, study like the different types of um, sea, the different types of fish, and wherever you were, or how did you know that when you saw the sharks, not to, um, you know, not to swim with them? Because at some places that's okay, some places maybe not okay. So how did you know? Um, what to expect, where you were, if it was okay to jump in and snow fall or not. I think, like for example, the shark story that we have is uh, like I think in the middle of the ocean like that. I think sharks, you know, they would be probably looking for something to eat. I think the safe shark is a uh, well, hammerhead shark, stuff like that. Those are uh, relatively small ones, and they live in uh, mostly on the close to reef, shallow waters. And uh, so I don't really know all the uh, details, but it's sort of, sort of you know, rough guess of these kind of uh, things. I mean, I wouldn't venture into doing that. And then so sort of like, uh, uh, I think for Steve, it was like a, a you know, big adventure is you know, uh, uh, swimming in the uh, like <laughs> middle of the ocean. And, uh, but I, uh, I would be afraid, you know, thinking like, what if sail kind of sails away? <laughs> or the, if, what if the current is so strong, you know? And even though you don't, we don't, I don't see it. Then maybe I kind of can come in. But I yeah. um, did you have bad weather? Did you have any storms that you had to survive? Oh yeah. Okay. So I, mean, I can't talk anything about the bad weather. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the bad weather. Uh, we were really kind. Of, uh, we were really careful, and we planned. I mean, there's a, a big chart of the looking at all those uh, uh, weather patterns, and uh, <clears throat> so I think. But then there's one uh, trip we made from uh, New Zealand to uh, Australia, the Tasman Sea, and uh, we. I, don't know, I think again, kind of we were kind of late because uh, uh, boys wanted to go skiing, and uh, June twenty first, to June twentieth, Mount Hood opens uh, their ski, and that was like a big thing because a lot of uh, U.S. skiers they fly down there. They say like without Mount Hood in New Zealand, they wouldn't be a skier because you know that's their winter. So it's the first day of the win summer. Their winter, they they open. So we thought that well, 
we you have we have to go. It's like we have to go. So and then because we laid, that got to get got us a little spent a little too much time in New Zealand, and so we left. Uh, and I I talk about this one in uh, the Tasman Sea, uh, Gale, and so we uh, and then there was a. Uh, I think I wrote down how many days. We were there several days in that sea, and it kind of feels slow, slow. And it's like when you're going, it's like a calm before the storm, and just exactly that's what happened. And it's like when I couldn't get out of the cabin, and then you know the cloud is right on top of you. It's like so, that makes it so cold. And uh, <clears throat> I think it was a, uh, uh, I wrote about it, and I, I was, I was going to the uh, my watch and sit down, and then I cannot see anything except uh, my red, red compass, compass that's red, and you, you kind of watch that, and then uh, so sit down, and then you kind of um, the wind takes you to the top of the wave, and you can you can feel it, you can feel it. It's like a wind runner. And you're and you on the top, and there's like magically, there's like a like pause. And then, you, and then you're almost like, and then I go, now it's gonna go. And then we just ride on the side of the mm -hmm. wave. And then when you go down, and I don't know, it's 20 feet, I don't know, just, just the incredibly big waves. And then you go down, and then when it's bottom, it goes like, you got to hit the wave, just like this. And then you kind of almost like hitting the, Stone, it's like, oh, yeah. And then we do that again and again. And like we did that, I don't know how many nights. And then, and well, we couldn't go make it to uh, Australia from that way. So we end up uh, sailing back to, uh, back to, uh, we left uh, uh, New, Car New Caledonia. Yeah. Uh, we sailed from New, Zealand, uh, New Caledonia to New Zealand, and then we were going to try to go, go to from New Zealand to uh, Australia, and so we couldn't really make the crossing, and so we uh, sailed back to uh, New Caledonia, and from there we sailed down to Australia. Do your sons both sail? Yeah. Hmm. Like, actually, my son, the older one, Stivaki, <coughs> is somewhere, I think, uh, he, uh, somewhere, somewhere it's just things were getting really, uh, the weather was kind of rough, and I was, I always keep, I kept getting sick, uh, seasick, and so I, I told him, I said, like, Stivaki, do you want to, do you want to do navigation? You know, you take a sun shot, and you calculate. And he was saying, oh, of course he liked it. He just absolutely liked it. I said, sure. Like, okay. So I, I made a little cheat sheet for myself. So I showed him what it is. And man, he learned so quick. And then it was a, so yeah, he navigated from, I think, the half of the way. How old was he? He was, uh, the, this second trip, was he was 14 when we left. So yeah, I think about probably when he was 15, he was navigating, and I didn't have to do it. And just a second, you go ahead and do it. So were you asking if they still sail? Yeah, I was curious. Oh, yeah. My, uh, my son, uh, my older son died, and my uh, the younger one uh, doesn't sail very much. But he uh, doesn't sail very much. Mm -hmm. But he kind of made his own little uh, kayak, and so he has a lot of interest. But doesn't particularly go sailing. He's the one that teaches at, at Dartmouth, you said? Mm -hmm. He's still alive? Yeah. What happened to your oldest son, I might ask? Uh, he killed himself. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. How many years were they homeschooled and did, did, it, did they, were they ahead or, or behind other, other kids their age when they went back to organized schools? Well, I think uh, uh, Arno, younger one, was uh, uh, he was uh, two years ahead, I think. He he didn't know uh, when I took when we took them to uh, 
Europe. Uh, I talked to the, I think there was an uh, English school, and he was, a, he was in, in the English school for one year, and then he went to Dutch school later on. And because of the, you know, he wasn't proficient in Dutch yet. My older son was all the way there. Baccalaureate program was in English, so he didn't have to uh, change. So he, uh, so he, uh, so I, I actually didn't. I myself didn't know what was going on, what the procedure was that for him to be accepted into uh, school on what level. I think they said they're going to accept him, and then they want to find. I guess they were, they want to find out what grade he was in. And because we told him you know, he was homeschooled, so my son comes out, and I said, "Are you gonna?" I, I told him, "Are oh, you gonna have a meeting?" I told him, <laughs> and then he comes out and says, "Oh, how did how did it go?" He says, "Like, oh man, I don't know." And I said, "Like, what do you mean?" And then uh, the uh, person uh, conducted the exam and says, "Oh, he did very well." And I said, "He said you did very well," and he says. I don't know how because uh, uh, I, I just uh, it's like uh, I had to stop because I had no idea what I'm doing and then I think there was a, a placement test so they just give you this long test until he cannot handle it then you know, they know where to place him so he was two years ahead. Um, what um, when you were fishing, what type of equipment did you have for fishing and what was the largest? that you caught? So I think a lure. That's called a, uh, a lure. That was a little, and then uh, was different kind of a uh, uh, skirt and with a, like a, sometimes this is like a spoon and those kind of things. And some, I think we even caught a shark sometime. And then uh, I have pictures of fish like, uh, some are like, uh, oh, almost up to here, like about five feet. Can you talk a little bit about like what the boys did in a day? Did you have uh, planned lessons that you gave them, or did they just simply learn by doing and fishing? And did you have a million books down in the cabin that they just picked out whenever you got to port? Well, there's a yeah. We had a lot of books, and uh, uh, I uh, I really. Uh, believing that uh, reading is the most important thing and uh, I always say all the problems you read even the mathematical problems you read carefully answer is right there they will tell you what they want so uh, so they were very keen in reading and both of them are very very good readers and uh, so I don't have to worry about because they were really good readers. They became really good readers. So number one, we don't we didn't have TV, <laughs> and uh, so we all kind of sat around the red when it's rain. When it rained, it, of course in Hawaii it doesn't rain that much. But then statistically in Hawaii they say 300 days sunny days and 60 days of ra rainy days. But I don't remember raining for 60 days in Hawaii. But anyway, every day also say like a cloudy days or rainy days. So uh, they, he did a, they did a lot. Uh, I had a, oh yeah, I had a regiment of the uh, st uh, every day from noon eight to noon. We are studying, so uh, we have this uh, regular. Uh, Pro, a progression of the science, either science or math, and then so we continuously we are doing that every day for um, eight to noon. Mm -hmm. So they uh, often in the harbor, they always kind of other uh, yaris with the uh, kids, and uh, so th uh, I think most of, uh, most people. Or at least the ones that we know have a similar schedule, so all the kids know. No, we cannot go there until uh, until noon. 
so they, you know, so everybody doing something. I don't know if they do the same, but then for us anyway, you cannot come here until noon. After that, you can come and do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. So, so there was a kind of a uh, our own uh, regimen, and uh, uh, so Steve had a lot of interest in because uh, his background is a philosophy. So a lot of those interesting uh, books. So they uh, kids like to uh, they were exposed and they like to read and then. Or in the, on the board, we don't have uh, anything, so they will make their own little drama. <laughs> <laughs> and they played music, uh, uh, piano and guitar. Which languages do they speak? Oh, uh, English. Just English? <laughs> Was that a problem in the different port stock? To make your basic Not really. <laughs> that really makes the English speakers kind of lazy. If I'm Korean, you know, I have to learn something more uh, universal. But yeah, English pretty much gets you around. Right. And then I, a second question I had is, did you have um, refrigeration and a water maker and all the modern? No water maker. Uh, refrigerator, we had a few times. Oh, uh, yeah, it's like a uh, propane refrigerator. And I think it probably broke down, so we didn't have, <laughs> so we didn't have refrigerator not, uh, not too long. So when you caught a fish, you had to either eat it or give it away, right? Well, like when we were in the uh, harbor, and it was kind of nice because we would just throw the gear net, then, you know, then we would catch a lot of fish, and we kind of give it to uh, people in the, in the village. They really, really like a uh, uh, fish, and uh, when we are out in the ocean, we kind of we can dry them, so uh, fillet them, and then you can kind of marinate them and put it in the sun because there's no flies or bugs. You can kind of put it up there, and then you can uh, make jerky. But if the oil, we kind of cook it and then we kind of eat it. What's your favorite subject, if you could study or reflecting on whether it be science or math or astronomy, or do you have a, a, a particular place that you really enjoy literature or reading about or experiencing? Yeah, I, actually, I like uh, astronomy. Astronomy. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you? Did all your navigation charts, were they in English? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> well, it's called a, a hydrographic office publication. Mm -hmm. So they uh, publish everything. And I mean, everything looks like a, a, a text table, you know, kind of great big thing <laughs> like this, and you <laughs> open it, and they would have thin papers, and then kind of, uh, I don't know, hundreds and thousands of pages. And they are all like this, thick and with a hard bound and big things. And uh, they have uh, everything. Mm. It's just uh, very interesting uh, uh, to read. Mm. Because if you're going to go in a certain place, and uh, you know, we usually kind of get the tourist to tour guide thing, and trying to if it's available, and read. And then when you go into this, uh, uh, hydrographic office publication, they tell you everything, like they say uh, about the historical weather pattern and the current what happened and uh, wind patterns. And, but then you know, just uh, uh, sometimes it, I don't think uh, our brain is able to kind of process everything to make sense out of it, but it's all there, it's unbelievable. No. Uh, um, I was just how did you um, plan for medical issues, or were you worried that um, maybe there was something you didn't have with you, or um, I was thinking like first aid kit or something, or fishing if you get um, hurt? Yeah, I think uh, now I'm older, I might be you know, thinking about those kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> I was young and dumb, <laughs> and we were uh, all pretty healthy. So you know, so uh, we had uh, uh, necessary precautions and then necessary uh, first aid stuff. But in the uh, 
in the ocean, uh, you know, you, you catch and those kind of things and heal pretty well because it's salty. It doesn't infect quite as much, I don't think. So I, I didn't think we had any kind of problems. Did you originally uh, decide you were to circumnavigate the globe and then decide against the Atlantic Ocean at some point? Did you did you have an ambition to, to go all the way around at one point? Well, I think it's usually it was his. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we uh, it seemed to it did make sense. Uh, we went to <clears throat> and the reason why I agreed to do this was. Uh, my kids would be okay, and uh, you know things that he wants to do, so uh, I will do it. And then when the kids are, are when uh, older one is 16, we want to take them back, take them to Europe because that's where we met, and so they will uh, finish the school, and then uh, you know things will work out. And kind of at that time, it kind of looked like uh, it's going to work. And I didn't have the circumnavigation as a part of the big goal of life. Uh -huh. And I kind of feel like that was sort of like a lifestyle. Uh -huh. And uh, but I mean, did you have set plans? You were the the voyages that you took down to the Tasman Sea, for example, and the Bora Bora. Did you plan it all out, or did it, did did you sort of play it by ear as you went well, along? Well, no, those are actually. Uh, when when we went on a trip, yeah, yeah we planned, yeah. So it's and then we said it's uh, we kind of uh, knew the boat, and it's two thousand miles. It's gonna take about twenty days, and then it took twenty one days for us to go there. And uh, uh, so it was a uh, yeah. Uh, <coughs> those are, uh, and then after that, when we originally when we left. Uh, Hawaii to go to uh, Bora Bora, and then we were going to turn around and come back. There was also the time when they were doing a, 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 the, they were doing a other um, boat. What's called that boat? I'm sorry. The one that uh, uh, they had an experimental from Hawaii to Bora Bora. You mean the, the Hokulea? Uh, yeah, Hokulea. As they built the Hokulea uh, to prove uh, the, uh, the navigation, Polynesian navigation. And so they uh, sailed with a Polynesian type of a, a Hokulea was built uh, with a modern material. But then all the design and everything was the uh, original. It was like Kantiki, Thor Thor Yeah, Iron. Yeah, yeah, except that this uh, uh, Hokule is a lot more sophisticated than Kantiki. was almost like a raft, more like a raft. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, huh. uh, so they were doing that around the same time we were... No, I think we left before Hokule did, and then when we came back, that's when the Hokule was coming back or something like that. So, so, uh, so we were going to do that. We were going to go to Bora Bora and come back just to see how we do out in the ocean. And uh, so instead of coming back directly from uh, Bora Bora to Hawaii, we went to uh, further to uh, west in the Cook Islands. And then we sort of made a triangle of the Polynesian Islands and all the way to uh, uh, Samoa. And uh, Samoa is a further uh, part of the west. So it's a, uh, the further west you go, the harder to come back. You gotta pit against the uh, northeast trade. And so, uh, so that trip took almost a year. So mm -hmm. that was actually, uh, when we went to, uh, from Bora Bora, we went to Tahiti, Papeite, and then we, instead of coming back, said, oh, uh, we, did a, we made a little bit of money uh, we did a chartering. Uh, the American doctors are having a uh, convention. So we, uh, they came on our boat and we took them out sailing. So we, we made money, we did it for a week. And so we had enough money, so we sailed go to all the way to Samoa and then we came back. So it was a sort of a uh, impromptu, but then there was a kind of, you know, 
plan, but they mostly uh, we plan to have. Have you ever run into other ships sailing? Like other people? You mean or? running into? Not <laughs> 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 crashing, but just like, hey, there's another ship over Yeah, we there. said a few, not the a big boat. I think the small boat, uh, a big boat, uh, a few of them. So uh, we call them on the radio sometimes. Mm -hmm. And one time, I think we are outside of a uh, Bali. And it was a really, uh, a really kind of uh, calm, it's almost like doldrum like. So we were afraid maybe we might get a, a pirate coming. You know, if that's yeah. the area, there's a pirate. So, so we were really using our engine a lot. And then uh, we were running out of uh, fuel. So there was a, a big ship was passing. So we radio them, so, you know, like, a, uh, we need a, a fuel and, uh, you know, let us, uh, the address, we'll send you a check. And if you drop uh, some fuel, they was like, oh, no problem. So about half drum, he filled about half drum of the uh, tank thing, and then they dropped it uh, in the water. And so then it was a uh, it was a quite a, a chore to retrieve that into the dinghy. We had to uh, uh, lower our dinghy, and then you have to go and then kind of retrieve it onto the boat so you can sail it on, so we can use the fuel. But then yeah, so we we met a uh, ship uh, like that, and then well, if you go to in the Pacific, uh, we didn't see that many. Once in a while, one or two. And but when you go to the like uh, uh, Malay Malaysia that area, so that, okay, that's one of the busiest uh, 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 sailing routes because all those ships going back and forth, all the things from China to uh, where wherever they go from all those stuff from Korea or Singapore. Mm -hmm. So that's just a really busy area. So you you see the ship all over the place. Um, were all of your uh, destination ports busier um, destinations in like larger countries, or did you um, go to sort of more remote places um, as well? Yeah, we really uh, spent. Uh, we went to a lot of uh, remote places, but you know, we always end up going. To, we have to go check in first, right? right? So uh, in. Pacific, a lot of places like uh, uh, Fiji, for example, is uh, you know the uh, Suva, the main harbor is really big and they have everything. Uh, but it's uh, still you just go next island, it will be remote and quiet. Actually, in Fiji was when my son uh, was windsurfing on the surf and. Uh, uh, he, he was catching fish. When he was windsurfing, he throws the lure out. And then, and then he caught fish, and he put them in the backpack. And then, <laughs> and then he came back with a, a number of fish, and then uh, we're saying, and the fish was bent, because in the backpack. And then he's so happy, and he, and he said, I'm going to go to this, I, I call the club Laitasi. That's where uh, we kind of anchored off. And uh, so he said, I'm going to go sell my fish there. I said, okay. So he did. He made the money. I think I remember it was like eight New Zealand dollars. And he was so happy. I think we got a picture of him holding the eight dollars. <laughs> Can you describe your boat? Is it two, was it pontoon? two pontoons and a cabin? Yeah. So we had a bridge. That's a, that's a really big boat. That's like a 48 foot on deck. And how high? Or how close to the water were you when you Well, were? it's a, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe four feet uh, above the, from the water line mm -hmm. uh, to the cabin, mm -hmm. uh, to the deck mm -hmm. of the hall. Mm -hmm. And then so there's another cabin inside uh, between the bridge. So, uh, so cabin, uh, board is uh, 48, but on deck, and then it's uh, 16 feet wide? No, 24 feet wide? 22. 
22. 22. Okay, so, uh, and then we got the inside the cabin is actually 16 by 16 the, on the, with the bridge. And so that was divided into four. Mm -hmm. So four eight by eight sections. So first thing when you come in, that's galley. And then a master's cabin. And then we had a dining area. And then we had a lounge. And the boys had their bunks in the hall. Oh, yeah. So you chose that design as a, uh, because of its, you could sleep so many people and it was very stable? I mean, catamarans are never, almost never tip over, right? So we well, can. Yeah, yeah, actually, Cameron, Cameron will tip over. But well, this is a really big, no, it's, it's a really big boat. I mean, we talk about the Cameron that's tipping over would be like Hobby Cat and small ones. Yeah, like yeah. Because they are really going, uh, you know, optimum. They can go as fast as they can, so they're really, half of the hull is hanging out there in the air. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it was a, uh, uh, the choice was sort of like a maze because uh, uh, Steve met the designer and uh, he was building and uh, we were right on the, we sent, we rented a lot together so we were right next to him, so. Can you talk about the title of the book, why you chose that? It's a Ring of Fire. Mm. So, uh, you know, there's a, that's actually a geographical name. There's a, uh, the, the islands all around the uh, rim of a Pacific uh, Ocean. So, uh, so I, you know, I, it's, I think, uh, what is this, uh, Johnny Cash had a, <laughs> so I didn't really know if he had a song about the John, uh, Ring of Fire. Uh, so mine is more like, uh, because we lived so much time in, uh, Sailed a lot of it in uh, Ring of Fire, you know, Pacific, uh, Hawaii, and uh, all those islands we sailed. That those are all part of the Ring of Fire. What's it like now that the book is done? Mm -hmm. how, how does it feel to have this book done? Uh, well, I don't know. There's. I think when you write, uh, you're kind of something like this. They, there's always somebody complains. <laughs> you know, in the family or you know. Somebody. But all, overall, I think uh, the reception has been great. And uh, what was the difficult part of writing it? Maybe there wasn't one, but was there? Well, places? yeah. yeah. Uh, about my son's death. I didn't go into too much of details, but uh, that was very hard. And uh, uh, you know, other uh, things in the, uh, in the course of it. And well, I think the real difficulty was also uh, trying to get the things straight. And so in that way, it was uh, helpful. And uh, uh, Steve kept the uh, uh, good uh, ship's log. So when I was writing, I didn't want to take the ship's log away. So I told him, why don't you just uh, send me the time that uh, we uh, went, uh, arrived, you know, where we went, what time. I kind of knew most of it, but then uh, when I was started writing, it seems like, oh no, I got the date mixed up here. And so he, instead, he said he took a copy of the, all the pages and mm -hmm. he sent it to me. So that was helpful. Mm -hmm. How did you end up in Vermont? Pardon <laughs> me? How did you end up in Vermont? Okay, my son was accepted to Amherst College. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, talking to a friend of mine I met on the boat. Mm -hmm. And she's uh, in Hawaii actually a long time ago. And she lived in Plattsburgh. So I told her, well, you know, uh, I'm going to move to uh, somewhere close to uh, where's the Buckman School. And uh, uh, she says, uh, why don't you go to Vermont? She's <laughs> right across the Champlain Lake. Mm -hmm. So Lake Champlain. So I said, OK. So that's why I came <laughs> to Vermont. And, and I'm glad I did. <laughs> <laughs> 
first I want to say thank you for taking so much time with all these questions, so thank you for that. Um, I'm curious, did, did either or both of you grow up sailing or have an interest in sailing? Because I'm curious, it's not a decision that most people come to to say, we're going to build a huge catamaran and hit the ocean, you know, and have kids. And so how, how did that life-changing decision happen? No, I think it's mostly from him, really. Okay. <laughs> so you can ask him. He, I think he, I remember him saying once. Yeah, my, my dad was outdoors, I won't call it. Uh, he was of the generation that moved from Lincoln, Nebraska Ranch to idyllic Florida. And anyway, he took me fishing it all the time, and I did him outdoors. So I got the outdoors bug. Uh, and travel uh, with my father. And uh, y you didn't even mention this in the book, but I think it's worth mentioning to give you special credit, you know, that uh, when we were sailing in the South Pacific, whenever we would import mostly uh, see a Korean fishing boat, uh, we want their food, <laughs> so, uh, and they want our company as a family. Uh, the Korean fishermen, that was part of the state Korean government's way of dealing with, they weren't convicts, but some kind of, if you had a, a record, you could choose to go fishing instead of prison. <laughs> and so, uh, and getting a record in those days was easy. So my point is, these were really educated people, and not our typical criminal. And what we learned from them is that the last thing in the world a proper Korean woman would do is go on a boat, in particular, because <laughs> it's not sailing. You know? <laughs> And I don't know if Yena, at her age, ever uh, was aware of that, mm -hmm. but we were made aware of it by Koreans mm -hmm. that uh, only low life do this. <laughs> anyway, that was take my hat off to Yena that she uh, didn't care about the, what people thought. <laughs> When you grew up in Japan, um, I, I spent yeah, a year in Japan yeah. as a, as a no, My mom is uh, born in Japan. Did you spend some time in Japan yourself? No. Oh, uh, I was wondering, uh, I, I spent a year as a, as a teenager in, in Kyoto, and I found the Koreans were discriminated against, very oh, much yeah, so by the, by the Japanese. There was a, a Korean school near us, and the Koreans were not allowed to associate with the Japanese kids at all. I think that's uh, the way I understand, but since uh, I haven't been there, I don't know the things, uh, how it is working, but then uh, very much so, like uh, uh, as far as I know, which can be very old because I left Korea almost 50 years ago, uh, until then, and somebody says that's still true, that Koreans never became become Japanese, even if we can, they can be, be third generation. Mm. Yeah. It's terrible. They still treat them badly. Well, yeah, they don't say so, and then it's no, not no. really on the uh, radar of our you know, news consumption, but uh, it, it is very much so, yeah, I, as far as I know. So there's a, uh, I think actually in Vermont, there was a, a troupe, uh, the, they were doing dancing, and they called it about something three something, so there was a, about the forgiveness of something. And then there was about Japan and China and Korea. There's all those dance, and they were all trying to make uh, peace. Uh, so that was somebody we went in there saying, guess who needs to apologize? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think what I'd like to do is actually introduce Steve Lobb. You know, I mentioned him as Steve before, but Steve was here about earlier. Um, Yana, you live with your husband Fred in Amherst now? Uh, well, uh, yeah, in, uh, close to uh, Greenfield. So it's thank you both, Fred and Steve, for being here and supporting Yana. 
in, in tonight's uh, presentation. And so we have some refreshments and books uh, if you want to um, purchase any. And, uh, and thank you, Yuna. This is quite a story.